Welcome to Plymouth Covenant Church Online. My name is Joe Lamondo, and I am so excited you decided to join us today for church. Isn't it awesome we have this technology that allows us to take our worship service and broadcast it to you? So no matter where you are right now today, in your living room, in your den, whether you're in your bathrobe, or hopefully you're wearing something, that you're excited to worship. So I want to invite you to interact with our worship today, just like you would if you were in the sanctuary. Stand up, sing, raise your hands, stomp your feet, get excited for worshiping the Lord. And as you prepare your heart for that, I also want you to know that you can engage with us with the chat online right now through the worship service. And if you need prayer, there's a live prayer room right now where we will pray with you and over you for whatever you might need. So let's just be prepared now as we enter worship to give God all the glory and all the thanks as we spend time with him. Have a great service. You've done for me. 
bridge with me one more time. So worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'll hear Christ be magnified. Where the
worship you, Jesus.
change everything right now in this moment. As we worship you, as we lift up your name, as our focus is on you, everything else has to bow to the name of Jesus. Our days have been filled with fear of the unknown, with anxiety, with so many things that are not of you. And right now we turn to you, Jesus. We fix our eyes on you. And we ask you, Jesus, change the atmosphere. Change my thoughts. Change my heart, change my emotions, God. I don't wanna be driven by fear. I don't wanna be driven by doubt. Come and bring hope, Jesus. Build our faith right now. Let us know who we are and whose we are. Thank you, Father. You're changing the atmosphere. As we bow, as we kneel before you, Jesus, we worship you, God. It's a holy place right now. It's a holy place. nursing home, God, every business, every car, every situation, with the hope that comes from you. We pray for your supernatural work among us, God. We pray that you will bless our homes, our lives, you will bless our communities, God, bless our neighborhoods. Bless this city, God. Bless this nation, Lord. Bless the rest of the world, God. Let your glory be known among us. Let your power be known among us. Let your healing and your resurrection be known among us. In Jesus' name we pray today. We thank you, God, for everything that you have done, everything that you are doing, and everything that you're going to do. You're a great and mighty God, and we worship you today. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. 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 Pastor Joe. at church online. We're so excited you chose this morning to join with us. Whether you're at home, up at your cabin, you're in your living room, in your kitchen, you chose to worship with us. I was reminded earlier this week of something Louis Giglio once said about 20 years ago when I first encountered who he was. And he said, worship is a lifestyle. It doesn't matter where we're here in, in a church building or you're at home or you're on the road, worship is a lifestyle. So we are so excited you've chosen to worship today and you can worship exactly where you are right now and the presence of God is with you. So today I just want to share a few things with you as we have some bits of information I want to pass along with you uh, what's happening here at church as, as life is continuing to evolve day by day. Some good news that our church office is going to be reopening this Tuesday. May 26th, normal business hours from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., Monday through Thursday from 9 to 3, our church office will be opening this Tuesday. Now, I say Tuesday because Monday is Memorial Day, so it won't be open on Monday. And also, I wanted to just also remind everybody that Memorial Day is a day this weekend that we get to honor those who have defended our country, who have fallen in battle. And so we want to thank all the families who have relatives from way back into the 1700s up until today who have served our country and have fallen. We honor them this weekend. 
And so starting on Tuesday, our office will be open again 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Now with that means also is that the curbside blessing and the pastoral hotline will be discontinued for now. Now we don't know what the future holds and is it possible that we'll have to reignite those again in the future? Of course, that's definitely a possibility. But for now, just be aware that the, the drive up blessings and the pastoral hotline will be discontinued and you just need to contact our church office or pastors directly if you're in need of assistance. With that also, I want to remind you that on May 30th, which is a week from sat this Saturday, the 30th of May, is our annual meeting. And that will be held on Zoom at 7.30 p.m. Not a.m. We know Pastor Dan wouldn't have one at a.m., right? It's 7.30 p.m., our annual meeting. And then our voting will take place the weekend of June 5th through the 7th. In addition to that, I just want to share with you that... Um, we are continuing to support our church through giving. And there are three options for you to continue to give. You can write a check and put it in the mail, put a postage stamp on it, and the U.S. Postal Service will deliver it right here. You can go online and you can go to our website, PlymouthCovenant.org, and you can give online there. That's exactly how our family chose to adopt giving about a year or so ago. And it's been amazing, just a few clicks away. You can also text the amount you want to give to 84321, and that will work as well. One last piece of information this morning I want to share with you is that we have a great adult ministry here at Plymouth Covenant Church. And we've composed this video to kind of give you a little highlight as to what's happening in our adult ministry. So take a look. I've had a great privilege to be around here a very long time. I used to be young when we got here, um, but have been able to watch and see and participate in how God has just done some amazing things through our women. Um, we've started Bible studies. We've started um, incredible events that we call Real Women, Real Life. Uh, we've started a MOPS program. Lots of exciting and cool things have happened here at Plymouth Covenant. That's how I know that as we step into the present, where things just seem so up in the air. We have, I've seen our women just absolutely be able to move to what is needed at the time. So because of where we've been, I know that God is gonna be with us where we go. Um, there's still big question marks over how that's gonna look and what we're gonna do together. Um, but I do know that whatever that is, it's gonna be amazing. So excited about the future of women's ministry. We have several things planned. Charlie and Dottie Duke are both coming in the fall. Can't wait to hear from both of them. Charlie's the astronaut, Dottie's his wife, and she is a quality woman. You do not wanna miss her. And then of course, we've got Kelly Minter on the schedule, expecting her to be here in October. But coming together in small groups is something that is just totally on my heart. I've seen it work amazing ways and women can connect and grow in their faith. So. All of that will be there. Join us. My name is Bob Leinberger. And I get the incredible privilege of being the pastor to adults, which means that I get to help find a place for people to belong. Not only that, I get to help point people in the directions towards Jesus. One of the things that I get the cool, awesome opportunity of doing is working with marriages and helping them find the best way to connect. Over the last uh, two years, we've had almost 200 couples devote 19 weeks to their marriage and re-engage. We've done all kinds of really fun stuff in small groups. In fact, we had the Listen Up series and the Why series, and through that, so many people have found friends for life. In addition to all of that cool stuff, we are doing some fun stuff now um, in the midst of these changing times. We have people meeting in Zoom groups. Just this last week, we had almost 200 couples come and get a date night material so that they could go on drive-in dates. We're providing small group materials for people so that they can meet and we're providing all kinds of resources for couples. I am so excited about what's going to happen in the future because God has given us a cool vision to be able to carry it forth in smaller settings. I am so excited about the opportunity for all of us gathering back together so that we can meet, have food, hang out, and join each other in what makes Plymouth Covenant so special. The men's ministry has been amazing this last year. Men are coming alive in ways that they've never experienced before. This last year, the men's Bible study has been building a sense of community in a way that they haven't experienced before. With Marked Men for Christ, men have been coming alongside each other, walking this journey of life together. And then also right now during this coronavirus time, it's been great to see the way that men have come together through Zoom through our men's Bible study, 
and then also with our Mark Men Phase 3 experiences, we have so many men that are attending and building each other up and coming along each other during this time. As we look ahead, we're hoping to be able to do Meat Fest. It's been one of our best men's events that we do each and every year. What does that look like? We're not fully sure yet, but we want to make sure that everyone is safe. And then also this fall, as we kick things off in September with Real Men, Real Issues, our hope is to be able to bring in Charlie Duke, astronaut from Apollo 16, one of the last men that's still living that has walked on the moon. Great things are ahead. We're looking forward to building stronger men for Jesus Christ. It is my great honor to be able to work with men and women like this around Plymouth Covenant Church. We can't wait to have you back. I think that was a record. We said the word Zoom more times in a service than ever before. The, the church has changed. We, we tried to do our best to minister in ways that God has given us, possible ways of reaching out to you. A lot of us were disappointed this past week when it seemed like the doors of our closed church were kept closed for a little bit longer. I need to tell you that I agree with President Trump, that it's, it's, it's essential. Our church is essential today, but it's also essential that we be safe, that we do whatever we can to guard your safety. And what we're going to be doing this week is meeting on Tuesday, and we're going to be having a long conversation about how we might reopen our church and keep it safe for everyone. So pray for us, uh, pray for our governments, pray, pray for those around us as we make important decisions. We're looking forward to having you back soon. Um, Joe did mention that today is Memorial Day, a day where people paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. And I would just like to pray right now for those around us. Could we do that? Father God, I'm so grateful that so many have given their lives in service of this great country. And many families continue to just struggle with the grief of the loss of a loved one as they served and gave that ultimate gift. God, I pray that you might comfort those families, whether it might be a dad or a mom or a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, or a brother or a sister, a friend, an uncle, an aunt. God, the loss continues. The loss is great. Comfort them by the power of your Holy Spirit and give them, God, an awareness of your presence and also, God, the great gift of freedom that we have here. God, I also pray for a new kind of warrior today, for those that are first responders, for those in the medical profession, for those that are in care facilities right now. Oh, God, I pray that you might surround them with your Holy Spirit and your heavenly angels, that you might protect them from the virus and from other things that can befall them. I'm so grateful for their courage and their compassion. God, I pray that they might know that you are with them today. And as well, God, I pray for our president and our governors and our leaders and, and our church, God, that we might make good, good, wise decisions during this transitionary time. I pray, God, that we might look to you and honor you in all our ways, that we might recognize that you are on the throne, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we can trust you. And God, we lean into you today. Direct us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing through our series of uh, Second Peter, and today we're going to look at some of the last words again that Peter shares with us. We need to be established in truth. I encourage you to go back and read the first 11 verses, uh, just rich material for you as you live your Christian life. Um, today, uh, Peter is going to turn his attention towards some of the false prophets and some of the opposition his church had been receiving. And we'll look at that in a moment. But let me tell you, if you don't mind, one of my favorite stories, favorite stories. It's about one of my friends who, who one day went out to uh, see his cat. And his cat had brought him a little gift. Do you have a cat that brings you little gifts? He went out to the porch. And there his cat was so pleased. He brought this little baby bunny to him. And the, the bunny had, had been dead for some time. And it looked just terrible. And, and as he looked at the little bunny, he realized not only was it a little bunny, it was his neighbor's bunny. He had a neighbor named Bonnie, and she had a little bunny, and, and this was Bonnie's bunny. And he said, oh, no, and it was covered in dirt. It was a mess, and he said, what am I going to do? And he did something that probably wasn't wise. He, he took the little bunny, and he took it, and he washed it off. He, he started to give it a shampoo, and, and then he took a hair, hair dryer, and he, he dried off Bonnie's little bunny. And he got it looking as good as it could. It looked pretty good, pretty good. And then he went over in the night and he put it back in Bonnie's bunny hutch. 
he put Bonnie's bunny back. He, he thought perhaps that would be better for her to find the bunny there. The next day he got up and he heard quite a commotion over at the neighbors and he couldn't see what it was. So he walked over and he talked to them and they were gathered around. They said, look at this, it's a miracle. And he said, well, what do you mean it's a miracle? Well, Bonnie's buddy died several days ago and we buried her right there and look, she's back. I, I love that story. I'd like to say it was a friend, but it was a friend of a friend. Uh, I don't know if it's true. doesn't matter if it's true. It's, it's one of those great urban tales, or rabbit tales, I guess. A folk legend. But what I love about it is it's fun, it engages us, but it's probably not true. D does that matter? Well, not for that story, but let me ask you another question. Is the story of Jesus true? Does, does that matter? Is it trustworthy? Is it something that you believe in? Of course, it has to be true. If the story of Jesus, if the gospel is not true, then we are to be pitied more than any other people. It is not a light to our path. It doesn't give us encouragement in the dark. It, it doesn't give us any hope for tomorrow. If the story of Jesus and of the scriptures is not true, we, we should just stop doing what we're doing as the church. Do you believe it's true? Today, I want to talk about how we might be established in truth. I'm going to ask you if you don't mind to stand if you don't. And I'm going to be reading out of the new NIV. And it just is a short text. And I'm just going to look at the preface here. Because I want you to sense what Peter is saying. So I will always remind you of these things. Even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory. As long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside. As our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. I don't know if you get it, but there's a sense of urgency in Peter's words. These are his last words. And he wants to remind all of us that it's so important to know that this story is true. Let me show you the urgency, if you don't mind. Let's go back to that text. Do you see the yellow mark? He said, I will always remind you. He said, again and again and again, I'm going to continue reminding you of these things. And, and he says, even if you're firmly established, I'm going to still remind you. And then he says, I will refresh your memory as long as I live, very aware that he only has perhaps a year to live in this tent of this body which will pass away. And I think he's thinking about what Paul told the church at Corinth, that this tent will go and God has a heavenly dwelling for me. He says, but I know that soon I will put this tent aside. So I want to make every effort. Do you see this urgency? Every effort. I, I want to stir up within you. I want to wake you up with every effort I can, whether that's writing a gospel through, through Mark, whether it's writing the epistles, uh, First and Second Peter, whether it's training up teachers. I'm going to do everything I can that you may be able to remember these things. Do you hear the sense of urgency? It's the same sense of urgency I have today. We live in a world filled with fake news. To me, if anything, during this, this, this crisis, this virus has taught me is I don't know who to believe. We have scientists who disagree. We, we have expert leaders who don't know where to go. And, and for many of us, this is a crisis of leadership because we don't know what is truly true. I think the same is about coffee. I don't, uh, you ever hear the experts on coffee? I love my coffee. And, and they change every day. Coffee's good for me one day, bad for me one day, good for me one day. All I know is coffee is good for me. And, and my question is, what, what do you believe about the story of Jesus? You know, it says, I want to remind you of these things. If you look at the, the blue letters, what are these things? Twice he says, remember these things. And I believe clearly, he's talking about the first 11 verses. You need to go back and read them again. You need to understand I. I really believe that what he's talking about is the faith that we've been received through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at that, I just go back to verse 4. It just is a highlight for me in those verses. Jesus' divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him. Very simply, in those first 11 verses, Peter was saying this. We, we have everything we need to live the godly life that God has. He gives us this faith, and he gives us peace, and he gives us grace. 
And we become transformed, divine participants in his nature. And, and we will not stumble and fall because our calling and election is sure. And there's a warm welcome waiting for us in heaven. So we need to add to our lives everything from goodness to self-control to knowledge to endurance to godliness to kindness and love. And, and Peter is so clear that these things are of utmost importance. All you need for a godly life is to be found in Jesus who he is, his power, his resurrection. He said, my urgency is that you are built on these things, established in these things. Are you? So if your neighbor comes over to your house today and says, so, so why do you believe what you believe? Then doesn't the Bible just argue its own sense of purpose and place? Isn't this just stories and fables? Wasn't Jesus just a good teacher, but he's gone, he's dead? How, how can you believe this? You see, today it's just as urgent as it was at Peter's time. And if anything, I want to wake you up and say we need to be able to believe firmly in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we have been called to a godly life and we have all we need to escape the corruption of this world, yes, and live as Jesus lived. So let's just look at three ways that Peter responds to the opposition. And he tells us why we can be established in truth. The first is this. We can be established by our personal testimony, by the personal testimony of Peter and his, his di uh, disciples, the apostles. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I just want to stop there. We didn't follow cleverly devised stories. You see, what they were accused of by the uh, false teachers at that time was the disciples on the day after the, the, the death of Christ gathered together behind closed doors. Yes, shocked at the events, scared of the threats, yet they were stubborn. And they were going to find a way to build a church. And so they got together and they collaborated together on a story. Now, this, this began, I think, by the Jewish leaders at that time to, to fabricate this story. But it continued to roll throughout history. And today, even, people say it's just a story that the disciples came up with. We have to work through the mythology of the scriptures. That's what this story is. The word is myth. And again and again, even theologians today have bought into this argument that the disciples didn't really, they made it up. I want to stop and say, no, Peter says, no, no, no. We didn't follow devised stories. We were eyewitnesses. One of my heroes is Chuck Colson, and, and he's gone now. He's in heaven. I can't wait to sit down with him. He's probably one of the wisest people. He, he and Rabbi Zacharias are having quite a party in heaven today, I believe, and and I, I just love the, the, the story that he tells about the Bible. If you haven't seen it, it's a, a powerful story of what, when he met with Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was just opposed to the gospel, any kind of prayer in the schools. And, and they had a debate one time, and, and he was talking about the Bible, and she said, you can't believe the Bible. The Bible's not true. It's just made up stories. And, and, and honestly, he took the Bible, and he, he handed it to her, and he said, show me what's made up. And, and she wouldn't touch it. It was like she was scared to death of touching the Bible. Pulled back and said, no, no, I... He said, there's power in this word. And then he, and then he told this story, and I just love this story. He said, Watergate, and uh, some of you aren't old enough to remember this, but I am. And, and Watergate, if you remember, was this conspiracy. It was uh, something that was uh, started by Nixon, and he had a whole group of men and women serving him. And, and what the story uh, unfolds is when they found out they were going to get caught, uh, 10 of the, the most powerful men in Washington gathered together and came up with a story, a lie, that would cover their tracks. And Colson says, I was a part of that. He says, we were together and we knew our careers, our freedom, depended on being able to tell this lie together, to tell the same story. It didn't last two weeks before John Dean came forward and others. And, and if you remember that whole idea, they could not keep that cleverly devised story because it wasn't true. And Colson goes on to make this point. So if the gospel writers made up this story, how in the world would they give their lives for a lie? Almost every gospel writer was killed, martyred for their faith for a lie? No, no, no. Peter, supposedly crucified upside down, 
continued to hold on to this story. He said, it's not some cleverly invented story. No, this is the truth. And, and I love what he says. I want to take you back to the transfiguration, he says. Let, let me give you an example why I so believe this is true. He said, we were there. Every sense given to mankind experienced Jesus in all his glory on that day, on that Mount of Transfiguration. That word transfigured means that Jesus was changed from his earthly to his heavenly state. And, and we see that. I, I want you, if you don't mind, just focus on the, the slide for a moment. Not on me, but on the slide. This is just an artist's rendition of what happened. And, and I believe those guys have uh, COVID-19 haircuts like a lot of us. You see how long their hair is. And, and that's Peter, James, and John, and they're there on top of the mountain. They didn't know. Jesus said, just come with me. And they came to the top of the mountain. And notice, every sense was engaged as they were eyewitnesses of the glory of Jesus. We saw, we, we saw Jesus transformed, transfigured. His face, it, it shone like the sun. His, his clothes as bright as lightning. We heard that the booming voice from heaven of the heavenly father who said, this is my son whom I love, whom I am well pleased. We felt the glory of the Lord, the honor of God, his majestic glory came down and rested on that place and we could not stand because we felt his glory. We tasted. We tasted that he was good, that God was good, that Jesus was good. Do you remember Peter's words? Let's just stay here. This is so good. Let's build three tabernacles for Moses and Elijah who represent the law and the prophets and for Jesus and for us. And let's just stay here. Let's not leave. This is so good. We don't want to go anywhere else. And we smelled. I think they were surrounded by a cloud, by the aroma of heaven. And as they inhaled, they took in the very presence of God in a profound way. Never to be the same. And I believe the transfiguration comes right after the story of Jesus predicting his death and his resurrection. And, and they go right back down the mountain. And these disciples are forever changed because they were eyewitnesses of the very glory of Jesus. We saw it. It's true. Can you believe us? Can you believe us today? As I tell this story, it's amazing. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It talks about the, the purpose of the apostles. What would they do? Their mission. And it was so simple. Wait and the Holy Spirit's power will come upon you. And when it does, you will be my eyewitnesses. Here, Jerusalem. There, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Here, near, there, and far. Witnesses. Much like the dangerous man we talked about in February, who, whose life was changed. He said, now Jesus, what I do? And Jesus said, just go back and tell them what you've seen, what you've experienced, what I've done for you. And I think that was the same commission on those great apostles. Just, just go and be my, not my lawyers, be my witnesses. Just tell them who I am. You see, I'm established in the truth of who Jesus is in the story because I look through the eyes of Peter, of Matthew, of Mark, of Luke, of John, of Paul. And these first person eyewitnesses tell me the story of Jesus, of his power, of his teaching, of his presence, of his promises to return. There's a movement in the church today, and I think it's a good movement, of saying we shouldn't be so argumentative about the Bible. You know, in the past, I was one of those that would say, well, the Bible says. You know, when I'm telling people about why I believe in the Bible, I would start with the Bible. The Bible says, and, and I would try and build an argument based on lots of different things, why the Bible was coherent, you could trust it, and, and I would often bring up scriptures where the Bible says, and, and, and my friends who didn't trust the Bible would say, I don't care what the Bible says. The Bible, speaking about itself, doesn't mean anything to me. And what I've learned is it's better to maybe say this, what Peter saw was this. What Matthew learned was this. Peter says, can, can you imagine with me, th this Peter, who followed Jesus and, and then didn't follow Jesus, who, who then followed Jesus again. Th this fisher of fish who became a fisher of man, transformed from a, a pebble to a rock. And, and he writes a second Peter, and he says, what I saw changed my whole life. Will you believe me? So, so the question is, will you believe an eyewitness? Can you be established in the faith that these men and these women 
And the early church saw and believed, surrounded by others who were there at the same time and could have contested their, their witness testimony. Many collaborating together, up to 500 who saw and eyewitnessed who Jesus was. We need to stop listening to the opposition that says we have nothing to believe in because what I believe in is true, supported by eyewitnesses throughout history. Do you believe? Can you be established in your faith by their testimony? There's a second thing that Peter says that's so good. He goes on and he says, but we must be established by the prophetic message as well. By prophecy. By the word of God spoken forth to us about who God is and what God is doing in the world. Well, what does it say? We have, been, we have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I love the prophetic message that he focuses on is this morning star. Luke chapter 1, verse 78, uh, Revelation chapter 22 speaks of Jesus as the morning star. And that star rises. It, it for sure rose up at his first coming, but it's coming again. That's what it says. This day that's coming, that will dawn someday soon, is Jesus' return. And that fulfillment, that prophecy is throughout Scripture. Can I be established in the truth that I hold? Yes. Just look at the Scriptures and the record the, the predictions in the Old Testament to the fulfillment in the New Testament, to the things that are happening even around us right now. You know, it's amazing when I look at the scriptures, you just have to stop and look at some of the things that are taught to us from, from Genesis to Revelations, from the time of the garden where, where Jesus turns to the servant and says, and the son of a woman will, will crush your head with my heel. You know, very simply speaking about the coming of Jesus from that time forward. From Genesis to Revelation. And it's interesting, I use the word revelation there. It was by accident. It's the revelation of Jesus. That's what that book is about. So many of you are listening to Pastor Bob, and I think it's so great digging into Revelation to try and discover what that prophecy means. And it's lifting up Christ and his story, just like Peter. That's what the Apostle John is doing. Lifting up Christ, the, the Lamb who was slain for us, who rules on the throne. Fulfilled throughout time. So sometimes you just have to look at the prophecies and and say, is this just an ordinary book, a simple book? Is what we believe in collaborated by anything else, or is it just by the eyewitness testimony of these early disciples? And you start realizing that for thousands of years, God has been arranging life, bringing about fruition, his plan. i uh, just give you an example, prophecy about his nativity. I mean, Jesus, he would be born in Bethlehem, an obscure little town. He would be born of a virgin, which is impossible. Who would even think about that? He would be bo born from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah's son. He, he would be heir to the throne of King David. All those things could not be prearranged by anyone. It goes on and tells us that his mission would be one, Isaiah 53, of a, a sacrifice to others, to set people free, Isaiah says, to bring about good news. His passion, even, even riding in on a donkey on Palm Sunday, predicted in Zechariah, or, or his death on a cross. Can you imagine? Even before a cross was invented, it was spoken of in the Old Testament that Jesus would be placed on a cross. His resurrection, his ascension. It's amazing the stories. So some of you know the, the, the road to amaze is a special story for me. And, and as you go through that story, the disciples were walking. It was the day after the death of Christ. And they dismayed because they thought it was all over and, and shocked that Jesus didn't rise to the throne. And, and, and these disciples are walking along the road and just complaining. And Jesus comes. The resurrected Christ comes and walks with them. And as he's walking with them early that morning, he, he hears their story. And, and they say, don't you know what's going on? And he kind of said, don't you know what's going on? Haven't you read your book? Aren't you established in truth? Jesus kind of says. This was spoken of long ago that Jesus would suffer. Everything is happening according to God's plan. And then he says this. Wasn't it clearly predicted by the prophets that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things? Then Jesus quoted passages from the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining what all the scriptures said about him. Take the 66 books of the Bible, and they're all focused on him, on Jesus. The eyewitness story of Peter is wonderful. 
but to have that collection of writings that point to Jesus and the plan of a sovereign God working out history is overwhelming. I'm established in truth when I just look at those prophecies. Someone said that the the likelihood of one person from the beginning of time to our time to fulfill all the, the major prophecies of Jesus would be 10 with 17 zeros behind it. It b- basically impossible for one person to fulfill all those prophecies, and yet they were in Jesus. Now, now there are other prophecies, not just about Jesus, but about other things that God was doing. I just read about Cyrus. It's just amazing. The Bible is filled with prophetic word that get fulfilled many years later. One of those is one we've overlooked, and, and I just love this one. And Andy Stanley brings this one up, and I just have found this so helpful. If you remember Jesus, a- after he prays over Jerusalem, which I talked about on Palm Sunday, After he prays over Jerusalem, he gives this prophetic word. And he says, oh, if you would only listen, Jerusalem. But you have not. So the enemy will come and they will build their ramparts, their ramps. And they will tear down your your walls. And every stone will be torn apart. And they all laughed. You, You see, the stones weighed over 500 tons. The walls of the city, the walls especially of the temple, were impenetrable. Even the mighty Romans cannot mess with our temple. And Jesus makes a prophecy here. And he says, in a short time, the temple will be torn down. And every stone will be broken. I've been to the base of the temple. And I've seen the crumbling rocks that are there. Because in 70 AD, just 40 years later, the Romans came. After a four-year struggle, they took the stones of the temple and they pulled them apart, and they heated them up and poured water on them, and they broke the 500-ton stones completely apart so they could never be rebuilt again. Even now, you go to the place where the temple was, and it stands empty because Jesus' prophecy, which every person who heard him say they could test in 70 AD, it came true. And the temple no longer existed, the old covenant seemed to change because Jesus had now come. We can be established in the truth because the foreshadowing of Jesus is fulfilled in his life and his promises for the future will come true. I walk through these uncertain days, certain of this one thing, that I have a sovereign God who's bringing about his plan and his purpose in our world, but in my life, in the life of those I love. And I'm established in the truth and in my faith because of the prophetic word. How about you? It says in the scriptures that we should do well to pay attention to this. Now, I find a lot of us uh, choose not to look at that. We look at the Beatitudes. And, and Jesus says, no, no, no. You should pay attention to this, Peter says. And I love this picture. And you might not like this, but I just thought it was so cute. I saw it this last week. This guy has, has no tires, but he has lots of tires. And I counted those tires, about 66 tires on, on, that, on that truck. Almost the number in the Bible. And, and I'm thinking, here's a man that is so tired, but he's got lots of tires. I just found that ironic. You are tired today? Maybe it's time to pick up the word of God and see that God who is arranging history has all you need. I have given you everything you need for a life of godliness. See how I've done it in the past, in the present, in the future. And I'll do it right now for you. Now, finally, I I need to be done. My clock is ringing here. Above all, we must be established by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though they were human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, now, don't miss this. The context of prophecy in, in the Scriptures is so clear. Deuteronomy 18, read it sometime. If a prophet speaks as if they speak from God and it doesn't come true, they are to be stoned to death. Because what God says comes true. And Peter is saying something that very, very profound here. We didn't come up with this. It's not by our interpretation, our imagination. Our, our, we, we didn't think that this was a good idea. No, 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 no. We were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We could help ourselves but write the words of God. I go back to Jeremiah chapter 1. Known as the weeping prophet. I call him the reluctant prophet. 
He said, no, 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 take this from me. I don't want to be a prophet. I'm too young. I'm too afraid. I'm... And God looks at him and it says, Jeremiah, I've set you apart from birth to be my prophet. I've been working in your life, your character, who you are, and I've placed my word in your mouth. And when you sit down to write, you will write what I've told you to write. You see, that, that's inspiration. You know, Peter, Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that, that the scriptures are inspired by God. Now, not like an Olympic athlete that has a great, great routine, inspired. No, 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 not like that. It's actually a Greek word, which means God has breathed his word into them. And Peter, I believe, as he's writing this, his last letter, realizes that he's writing the word of God. Can you imagine that? The word of God. You see, very clearly, Jesus said, I speak to you truth, but my, my, my spirit's going to come and he's going to lead you into all truth. And, and I think he's going to raise up other truth tellers like Paul and Peter and John and James. Listen to them. Because they bring the prophetic word from God the Father, carried by my spirit. Do, do you believe that the Holy Spirit can not only inspire the word? In other words, the word that we have on printed page comes from him, but also that the Holy Spirit helps us to interpret and apply that to our lives. When, when I sit down at the Bible, I realize that this is a miracle, that this, this is truly a holy Bible, meaning it was given to me by the Holy Spirit. And when I open these pages, the very Spirit that carried those disciples along carries me along. A profound book, a profound story. G.K. Chesterton was brought together with a bunch of intellectuals one day, and they sat around a pint and talked, and, and they asked him this question, uh, all of them this question, if we were to be shipwrecked on an island all alone, what, what is the one book that you would like to have? G.K. Chesterton was a, a well-known Christian, and, and all of them assumed he'd say the Bible, and he surprised them. You know what he said? No, no, what I would like is Thomas's book on shipbuilding. If I'm stuck on an island, I want something I can use. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has given us a story of Jesus that's true. It's useful. It's profitable in every area of our life. If I were to choose one book, it would be the Word of God. You see, it established me in truth because it was the testimony of the personal eyewitnesses. It, it was in many ways a fulfillment of prophecy. And it speaks to me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you listening? It's interesting. The scriptures were written over 1,500 years by over 40 different authors. And yet it's amazing in its consistency and coherence. How can a book over such expanse, three different languages, continents, amazing to think about. Here's a graphic that's going around the internet, and I picked it up quite a long time ago. It's just the 66 books of the Bible. That's the lines at the bottom and how long those books of the Bible are. And, and then the lines are drawn. These are lines that are cross-references from the Old to the New Testament. And, and each of those, depending on the distance in time, different colors. Just amazing to look at the coherence of the scriptures, which it, it fits together like a glove. The Bible is a miracle given to us by the Holy Spirit. You should pick up and read, pay close attention to it. This was the urgent message of Peter. I want you to know that your truth that you have can be deeper, established by our testimony, yes, by the prophetic message, yes, by the Holy Spirit, yes. So let me go back to Bonnie's Bunny. I wish it was a true story. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be cool? Better yet, wouldn't it be great if they came out to the hutch and Bonnie's bunny was alive? <laughs> Not just dressed up, but alive. You see, why I like that story is so many of us as Christians, we live as if Jesus is dead, and we dress him up, try and make him look good, place him in the hutch called the church, and ask people to come and say, oh, he looks pretty good. When in fact... Jesus is alive. 
I don't need to dress him up. He is here. He's real. He's with you right now in your room, beside you, wherever you are. He is alive. And I am a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm established in the truth that it is real. And if it is not real, if I can't believe it, I have no business talking about it. Are you established in truth? Let's us become eyewitnesses of the prophetic word of God as we're carried by the Holy Spirit to a world desperately needing truth today. And when people ask us why we believe, say, because I know deep down within me, I've been established in the truth. Let me tell you why it's real. Let's pray together. Father God, we live in a world where the Bible becomes optional. It's not essential. Many of the things we do in the church are not essential, and yet, God, for me, I believe that the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ is the most important thing that the world needs to hear. That, God, we've been given a gift, that you have given us a gift through Peter and others that we might be deepened in our faith, established in what we believe, to know for sure that we have everything we need for a godly life, to build on our faith, to be transformed to a place where the world sees that the resurrection power of Jesus is alive in us. Oh God, my prayer is that people might be established in their faith today by just looking at us to see that we truly believe what we believe. Thank you. By your Holy Spirit, carry us along. Inspire within us the word of God. Help it to take root And might we be established in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us again this week. Now we hope and pray that you would go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus to the community and the world around you. Now that we've had church, let's go out and be the church.